Uh, so hi everyone and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Gazai and I'm the Director of Member Services and Learning at Orchestras Canada. I'm glad you could all make it today uh, and I won't take too much of your time before we get started. Um, I want to note that the session is being recorded and, and will be shared on our website in the coming days. Uh, Catherine's presentation will be followed by a Q&A, so feel free to type your questions in the chat um, as, uh, as we'll get to them at the end. Before we start, uh, I want to mention uh, that Orchestra Canada is a virtual organization, which means that we all work from where we live. My office uh, is located in Kingston, Ontario, on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, the Anishone, and the Huron-Wendat, and I want to recognize the enduring presence of the First Peoples. Today's presenters need no introduction, uh, as I'm sure you all know her. Uh, Catherine is our executive director, and without further ado, um, I will give her the floor for the remaining of the session. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David, and uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's call. Just to get a sense of the geographic variety uh, of, of participants on today's call, please do feel free to find the, uh, the chat box uh, and to let us know who you are, uh, what organization you're connected with, and uh, what provincial riding you are in, uh, if you know. Uh, that'll be really helpful to us as we uh, plot through next steps. So today's Lunch and Learn was really inspired by a request that the folks at Orchestras Canada have of our members and friends across Ontario. And that is, we would really, 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 can I add one more really, like you to share Orchestras Canada's pre-budget recommendations with your member of Provincial Parliament by email, by mail, or in the context of a meeting. How come? Why are we asking this at this point? Uh, candidly, it's tough times. We need your help to put the arts on the public agenda as not just a nice to have, but something that's absolutely essential for quality of life and economic vitality in Ontario communities. It's also a question of access. Quite candidly, local organizations are more likely to get a hearing from members of provincial parliament than we are. I can meet with our local member of provincial parliament, Dave Smith of the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario, I can submit briefs until my head falls off through the uh, official channels, but I don't necessarily, we don't necessarily get the kind of take up on our recommendations that we'd like to see from members of provincial parliament right across the province. I think you can do this in a way that we quite simply cannot, but it's also true that we can support you. We can also do the research and frame the recommendations that we hope you'll find resonant uh, and that you'll be prepared to carry forward. We're doing all we can, but this is genuinely a team effort. It's also a long game. Uh, we need to change hearts and minds across party lines, and you can help with that. Your storytellers, you're passionately committed to the arts in your communities. Uh, you're engaging people, you're doing great work, uh, and we hope to be able to capitalize on the relationships that you have or can build. I think this is also a question of movement building. We need to identify arts champions in all political parties in the province, and you can help with that. Are there risks associated with this? Uh, are, are we asking you to take a risky position here? First of all, biggest risk is it will take time, and we know you were busy. Uh, but we've tried to make it as easy as possible for you to engage in this work and for you to succeed. We've done the research, we've done the network building with other arts service organizations in other disciplines. Uh, we've drafted a template letter that you can customize to send to your member of provincial parliament. And we've also provided links to uh, help you connect more easily with your MPP. I'll do a guided tour of that a little later. Another question that comes up from time to time is could you as, as people affiliated with registered charitable organizations, could you lose your charitable status uh, if you get too aggressive at setting up meetings with your member of provincial parliament? Uh, the short answer on this one is no. Uh, the Canada Revenue Agency uh, updated um, some point between 2016 and 2020 their guidance to uh, charitable organizations 
and in particular, uh, what kinds of activities are acceptable and indeed encouraged uh, for registered charities to participate in. And I'm just going to do a little bit of comedy with the old screen share uh, and see if I can turn uh, turn up something for you in terms of the, uh, of the public policy. We've also got links um, elsewhere and I'll ask my colleague uh, David to uh, to slap the, the link into the chat, uh, but I will bring this this up right now. Okay. Take a brief pause here while my screen share is loading. And it being Canada Revenue Agency, uh, they do have a policy, a lengthy policy on public policy dialogue and development activities. And to summarize, uh, a rather long and wordy web page. Shorter answer is what you are doing. As we scroll on down, is to help uh, clarify for you that the work of talking to your MPP, doing some education about the nature of the work that you do, and share uh, public policy recommendations with them. You may absolutely share information. You may share research. You may disseminate opinions. What you can't do is engage in partisan political activity. So we endeavor at Orchestras Canada to be absolutely and rigorously nonpartisan in our work. We'd urge that on you as well. Okay, so that's the that's the Canada Revenue Agency aspect of, uh, of the risk of losing your charitable status, which in my view, uh, in this particular activity, uh, is not a risk that, that you're running. Another question specifically for Ontario organizations uh, relates to the Ontario Trillium Foundation, which has slightly uh, different requirements in terms of organizations and activities that it will fund. And again, I'll bring those up uh, on the screen. And as I say, Trillium's policies are a little different uh, than the Canada Revenue Agency's, and it's important to understand that organizations engaged in political activity supporting or opposing any political party, elected representative or candidate for public office. So again, that uh, restriction on uh, partisan political activity and they also don't fund organizations that have a primary purpose of bringing about change in law or government policy. So because advocacy is part of Orchestras Canada's uh, mandate, um, we may have some issues getting money from Trillium. You, on the other hand, as uh, Ontario registered charities and potential applicants to uh, Trillium do not. You will simply be uh, sharing this work, but it's not the main focus or primary purpose of your organizations. So just thought I would share that in terms of the um, some of the risks that you might be concerned about facing. Okay, covered risks, I think. Let's talk about benefits. As passionate arts workers, artists, arts advocates, uh, this is a chance for you to build awareness for your organization and for the work that you do. It's also a chance to develop a relationship with someone who can actually help you when needed. Uh, it might be by carrying the Orchestras Canada pre-budget brief forward, uh, but it might also be, let's say you apply to the Trillium Foundation for a grant. If your MPP already knows something about you and has a sense of the, the quality of the work that you're doing uh, and the sort of focus of the things that you, you dream of bringing to your community, it's more likely uh, that they will recommend your application for serious consideration. Similarly, <clears throat> with summer employment grants, if your MPP is familiar with your organization, knows who you are, uh, appreciates what you're doing, maybe more likely that they'll, they'll put a, a tick beside your name uh, in those applications. So in terms of those conversations with MPPs, moving right along here, there are things that your MPP, that you think they should know, but they might not. They include things like the fact that you, are, you operate as a registered charity, the fact that you generate your revenue from a range of sources, ticket sales, sales of service, donations, sponsorships, and potentially as many as three different levels of government. There are people in the world who believe that orchestras are 
um, almost exclusively funded by government and that we don't generate uh, very much of our own income at all. Um, we know that's not true. In Ontario, the average is about 70% self-generated revenue from that combination of earned and contributed income. That uh, an average of 30% comes from all levels of government. For many of the folks on this call, uh, it's a far higher percentage than 70%. So just, just to put it out there, that's a great piece of education that you can do. I think it's also important to talk about the kinds of jobs that you create, whether they are full-time jobs or whether they are uh, part-time contract work with your artists or cultural workers. It's also useful for them to understand something about the number of performances that you give and how many people you connect with over the course of a season. They may be interested in knowing what it is that you're doing online for those of you who are still presenting online content. They'd like to know about the kinds of educational programming that you engage in. They love to hear about the number of volunteers and the role that volunteers play in your organization. My impression of Ontario's orchestras is that you are simultaneously very professional and very grassroots. And that goes for the largest and the smallest uh, of the orchestras on, on today's call. It's also good for them to hear a bit about who your key partners in the community are. Are they school boards, colleges and universities, your venue, church groups, other arts groups, et cetera, et cetera. They need to hear about that too. They may also, although we don't talk about COVID and COVID recovery very much anymore, um, your observations on COVID recovery, what you're still worried about, what you're working on, uh, what, the, what the impacts have been. So rolling on now to the 2024 context for the Ontario pre-budget brief. We know that the government of Ontario is preoccupied with the economy, uh, that they are obsessed with questions around affordability, about housing availability and cost, about the impacts of inflation, about opportunities to grow jobs and the economy. I think it's fair to, to well, it may not be fair, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, the arts are not at the center of their preoccupations. And I think it's also fair to say, uh, we are not looking to pick a fight. Uh, that's not a fight we're going to win. Um, we are instead looking to draw their attention to the size and situation of our sector and the role that orchestras and the arts more broadly play in helping to solve problems that they have already identified. You know, it's one thing to uh, focus on critical minerals and attracting uh, new manufacturing concerns to our communities. It's another thing to talk about what it is that would actually attract skilled workers to move to a community, to establish their lives there, to raise their families there. And there's all kinds of reasons to believe that the arts play a key role in helping that to happen. So those are some government obsessions and my potted analysis of uh, how we might play a role in helping government address these things. In terms of orchestras, here's what we think we know about the current situation that you find yourselves in. I think it's fair to say we are still in pandemic recovery. Many of you, uh, through your participation in Orchestras Canada's annual comparative report and our dear friend, Steve Smith, our statistician, um, Steve will be releasing the 22-23 fiscal year edition of our comparative report uh, later this week. Um, we've had a, a quick glance at it before it, uh, it heads out to you. And uh, no big surprise to many of you, I suspect, uh, what those numbers that Steve has collected from you reveal. Audiences are down still considerably from the pre-pandemic era. The numbers of total performances are down. Spending is up. Government funding is flat. Philanthropy is extremely challenged to fill the gaps. We also know from the Canada Revenue Agency data and from reports filed by Canada Helps that fewer Canadians are donating and volunteering. 
We know from our own recent state of the sector research that orchestras are facing unprecedented levels of turnover in both staff and volunteer roles, as well as among artists. We need audience and donor renewal, we need artistic renewal, and we need a renewal of organizational energies as well. In short, it's kind of a perfect storm. So from this uh, rather chaotic uh, uh, scene uh, that we're looking out over, um, we took inspiration for this year's recommendations. Um, some of the sort of inspiration I can, I can describe as going like this. First of all, woe is me won't necessarily cut it. We need positive, productive recommendations that make it clear that we are very much alive, very much in the game. We need to collaborate with other artistic disciplines for critical mass. We need to put across the message effectively that we are drivers of quality of life, active participants in local economies, and part of what makes living here good. We also need to focus on issues that are genuinely within the province's mandate to address. Um, so it's all very well to ask the province to uh, do all kinds of remarkable things, but if it's not within their constitutional powers, we're barking up the wrong tree. We need to give that a rethink. Accordingly, we've, we've crafted three recommendations that we have made in the form of our recommendations to the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs for the province of Ontario. And uh, David, I'm going to ask you now to uh, share, a, share a slide for me, please. Feel like I should be asking for a drum roll. So our respectful recommendations go like this. I'll read them through, although you can all read, uh, and then we'll talk about each one. First of all, we are requesting an additional $5 million per year uh, to be invested in the arts through the Ontario Arts Council starting in 2024-25. Secondly, we are asking that the province of Ontario invest $25 million over five years to relaunch the Ontario Arts Endowment Fund at the Ontario Arts Foundation. And finally, uh, we are asking that the province of Ontario study, pilot, and then scale an adaptation of a highly successful program from the province of Quebec called Soutien aux sorties scolaires en milieu culturel. Uh, which is essentially subsidized field trips uh, by class groups to uh, cultural performances and organizations, guaranteeing each school-aged person in the publicly funded school system in the province of Quebec two such trips per year. Okay, so those are our three uh, recommendations. I wanna talk about each one in turn. First of all, the Ontario Arts Council. Uh, the OAC currently receives a core grant, uh, core allocation from the province of Ontario to the tune of $60 million. Uh, this number has gone up and down over time. Uh, right now, it's sitting at the same level that it has been uh, at various points over the last five or six years. Uh, but Part of the point we're making is it has been essentially at that level uh, for five years now, uh, despite the growth in the population of the province, as well as the impact of inflation. The Ontario Arts Council needs more money in order to preserve its reach, ensure that it is able to start to fund uh, worthwhile artists and worthwhile groups, uh, and essentially uh, to do the great work that it's been doing since 1963. Does the Ontario Arts Council need more than five, an additional five million per year? You bet. Do we think that a, a bigger request would get us a respectful hearing? Uh, candidly, we do not at this time. We think that this is a reasonable ask uh, and in fact, somewhat exceeds what the province's own recommendations to the Ontario Arts Council were in terms of the ask that they were asked to bring in. We're asking for a little more than 8%. Uh, and my understanding is that the province is potentially uh, encouraging the OAC to be looking at 
a 4% increase. So we're still pushing the envelope a bit. More would be uh, remarkable, uh, but we start from what we see as being the art of the possible. And in line with something close to what the OAC itself is likely to be outlining in its own requests. The second recommendation is a bit of a back to the future. Uh, and a number of groups have been working behind the scenes. I believe I see Matt McGeechee from the Toronto Symphony Orchestra on today's call. Hi, Matt. Um, and this is something that uh, a group of the largest arts organizations, as well as a number of service organizations have been uh, working around. I wonder, I don't know if I can do a, a, a show of hands, but some of us uh, with silvery hair will remember the Arts Endowment Fund program that was run by the Ontario Arts Foundation between 1998 and 2009. And essentially what it was, was a challenge grant program. The province invested a grand total of $60 million over that period of time. Uh, and the money could be used if arts organizations could match uh, that contribution. The combined money pooled between what the arts organizations raised as exceptional fundraising from their donors and sponsors and the, the province's match were went to the Ontario Arts Foundation uh, and have been stewarded very carefully. It's now a $157 million fund from which approximately 250 participating arts organizations from, from across Ontario in communities large and small, all artistic disciplines, um, receive an annual uh, check from the Ontario Arts Foundation uh, made up of interest on the investments that have been so carefully stewarded by the Ontario Arts Foundation. The cool part about this program is it's long-term thinking. It was one-time money from the province that created the $60 million matching money. It was one-time gifts from uh, donors and sponsors that helped to match it. And yet every single year since then, with precisely one exception, uh, money has gone out from that fund to uh, participating Ontario arts organizations. Um, so started with a principle of 120 million and it's now paid out 120 million uh, to Ontario arts organizations. We like this because it's about long-term stability and it's also about providing an incentive for donors to give. So thank you, Ada uh, from Brantford. You know, it's it's a small contribution, but it's a stable contribution and it's there in perpetuity for you. So it's one of those things where we think it's a good idea. Goodness knows we need the help uh, providing incentives to donors to give. And we think that there's a way of building the program so that small organizations and large ones uh, can benefit proportionally, but that there's opportunities for all. Final recommendation, and this is the um, relates to what I describe as my profound interest, and I think our shared and collective interest in renewal of arts and music organizations um, across Ontario. The key to me has always been in arts education, um, and our partners in this, we hope, can be publicly funded schools, uh, places where so many of us had our first encounters, uh, not only with our own opportunities to make music, but also with professional practitioners, whether they were our teachers, whether they were guests who came into our schools, whether they were people and, and groups that we were exposed to uh, on field trips. We see that orchestras have an absolutely vested interest in engaging with more uh, people of, of school age, uh, that those initial opportunities to hear a symphony orchestra in full cry can be absolutely transformative uh, to the, the, the prospects of, of someone who wouldn't have had a chance to encounter them otherwise. What we love about the Quebec program is the fact that it's a collaboration between the Ministry of Education provincially, the Ministry of Culture and Communications provincially in Quebec, 
as well as the Provincial Funding Council, the Arms Link Funding Council for the province of Quebec, where all three partners are working together, first of all, to ensure that uh, the right to those, those two field trips each year is enshrined in the curriculum and in the uh, sort of education policy of the province. And secondly, that there's funding available to ensure that schools can participate and that arts organizations can develop and deliver really engaging programming specifically for school-aged audiences. So it's really a win-win and win. Um, I, I, I can't enthuse enough about the, the potential uh, that this program represents. Um, we have a successful model to point to uh, and obviously some urgency in uh, bringing Ontario in on this. So we're suggesting study it, pilot it, and then scale it up so that it is province-wide over time. So the next thing I'd like to do, and I may have to ask, let's see, let's see if I can do it. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing this screen at least temporarily, and I will move on to another, uh, another slide that I want to share. I said earlier that we want to make this as easy as possible for you to participate uh, in, in this work, and we've provided some resources to, uh, to help this happen. And I'm now going to share uh, a web page on the Orchestras Canada website uh, that we updated just this morning with some fresh new materials. Um, and we will feel free to uh, slap the link into, into the chat. We will also include it in our, our follow-up notes to attendees today. Uh, so what we have on this page on the Orchestras Canada website is uh, a summary of the recommendations that I have just provided to you. We have a link to the complete brief uh, in PDF form. We have some, whoops, it says Queen's Park uh, quick links. That'll be Queen's Park by the time you look at it next. Um, I'll just zip through to this and, and show you uh, what, we, uh, what we have here. Um, some cool tools from the Queen's Park website, uh, answering all the all important questions. Who is your MPP? And I'd say you probably all know who your MPP is, but another fun game to, to play is who are the MPPs who represent the people in our audiences? And simply by entering postal codes of folks in your audiences, you can uh, do a little research to find out if you are reaching beyond the riding where your uh, orchestra is headquartered. Uh, next question, when is your MPP most likely to be in your riding in 2024? And as we can see, they're in the ridings now. Uh, they will be heading back to Queen's Park February 20th, um, but the dates listed below are uh, all dates when they are expected to be uh, back in the ridings or, uh, or, or, or close to it. So this is really handy because if you're trying to plot out potentially an invitation to your MPP to attend a performance, uh, it's always a courtesy to have checked the sort of uh, big outlines of their schedule and to focus on dates where it's more likely that they will not be uh, required to be voting at Queen's Park. So that's useful. Another thing to look at is who's actually on the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. Um, I note, for example, we have a number of people from uh, Kitchener-Waterloo on the call today. Welcome, it's great to see you. Um, and I know, for example, that the Vice Chair of the Committee is uh, MPP Catherine Fife from the Waterloo Riding. So nice to kind of check that out. And if you have any particular connection to one of the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs members, uh, this can be useful uh, for all of us. There's also the uh, link to the formal call uh, for pre-budget submissions, which obviously Orchestras Canada obeyed. The deadline is 31st of January, as well as an online form uh, for sharing uh, budget recommendations. So we'll, we'll stop the share now. Just thought those are useful things to be able to have access to. We're gonna save you the time of, of cruising around the uh, province of Ontario's website. Okay. Um, and I think other than uh, one other item on uh, that Orchestras Canada webpage, 
uh, which is a template piece of correspondence that we drafted for you. Uh, and that is something that can be turned into an email or a letter on your letterhead. We're basically saying, you know, here, here's a, a framework for introducing your orchestra, for sharing Orchestras Canada's recommendations with your MPP, uh, and for asking uh, for a meeting or for them to attend a concert, if that's something that uh, that you think can can work within your schedule and theirs. So that web page, um, and again, the, the link is, I'm sure, somewhere here, uh, will have um, resources for you just to try to make it as easy as possible uh, for you to reach out to your member of provincial parliament or members of provincial parliament uh, to acquaint them uh, with our brief, uh, with the asks, but really much more importantly, ensure that they know uh, something about your orchestra and have a sense of the, the work you're doing in the community and ways in which they can help. So I see we're now on 1231, which as far as I'm concerned is, is perfect in terms of me stopping talking and uh, to get to hear questions from you at this point. So at this point, I'm gonna do a little scrolling down to see what's, what's uh, come in. And I'll also ask for uh, help uh, from my colleagues at OC to identify any questions that have come in so far. I will also tell you that one of the various, very hardest things in the world to do is to stop talking and wait while others organize their thoughts. So I think we're um, at a certain point um, and I'm more than happy I think we're a small enough group, right? Uh, so I have a comment, uh, not uh, so much a question, uh, but Joanne uh, from Joanne Allo from the Brantford Symphony and uh, Joanne as a, a retired school teacher herself uh, knows very well, school boards find transportation to cultural events cost prohibitive. And you're absolutely right. Um, I was fascinated uh, to note, Joanne, that this was one of the focuses of um, enhanced funding availability in the province of Quebec. They are facing the same challenges with school bus scheduling, insurance, and the costs of transportation uh, to get students to cultural venues. And the province has decided to step up and acknowledge those, in, those increased costs and, and to subsidize them. Uh, because this is um, absolutely um, a, a challenge. Uh, but if I, I'm going to sound a little casual here, please forgive me. Uh, but problems that can be solved with just a bit more money are relatively easy problems to solve if there is the will. So uh, it's not just um, the cost to cultural organizations of presenting those programs. It's also ensuring that uh, schools have equal access to the opportunities. I don't know about you folks, but one of the really inspiring advocacy organizations that I turn to uh, from time to time for um, insight and, and inspiration is an organization called People for Education. Uh, they have, uh, pre-pandemic, they did a near annual study of the availability of arts education in Ontario schools, and what they regularly turn up is the fact that if it's a wealthy school in a wealthy school district, they have arts education programming and they have access to resources to enhance the core offerings. If it's a rural school or a school in a um, less well-off area, capacity for fundraising is really limited. They simply don't have access. It's a matter of simple justice to try to address the imbalances and to ensure that children right across the province from whatever uh, economic background have an equal opportunity. So again, this is something that money can solve.
Right. And Joanne has made an additional uh, sort of observation about uh, uh, Quebec arts support. You know, it's easy for us to say it's Quebec, it's different. There's a, a, a commitment to keeping the French language and culture alive uh, in a, on a continent that uh, would otherwise um, not have been uh, receptive to that level of liveliness. So there's a definitely um, a small p, small c, political and cultural imperative to make that investment. We can also learn uh, from what they've done. And I, I, I think it's important that we push our, our decision makers to consider ways in which we can model, uh, we, can, we can build on models that they have already tested for us. So thank you for that, Joanne. Okay. Um, so uh, we have a question, uh, a heartfelt uh, question from Bianca Chambers. Uh, Bianca, am I safe to say which uh, which orchestra she went with? Okay, uh, Oakville Symphony. And uh, Bianca's comment is, we generally have an MPP that isn't very interested in us. Uh, and they're in their third term. Uh, general feeling of uh, lots of smiles uh, if you get the meetings and and then they ignore you, uh, making it hard to stay motivated. Any tips? Um, this is a tough one. Uh, and I, I salute your courage and your, your willingness to keep at it. I'd say the thing that keeps me going in, in situations like this one is, well, I've got, I've, I've got a few uh, to uh, to offer to you. Uh, first one is we are playing a long game. There is there is no question about it, um, and we simply don't know which seeds planted where uh, will result in the kind of of response that we're seeing. Um, I will also say that um, it may be helpful um, to do a couple of things. First of all, the request really is not just. Uh, read this brief. It's also go back and talk to your colleagues in, in your caucus about this um, and understand how it is that uh, these recommendations might potentially have an impact on your organization, but more broadly, your own community. Uh, and other than saying, keep on keeping on, and the fact that there were smiles in those meetings um, it is already a sign of, of some form of progress. Secondly, uh, I think the other thing that I said earlier, I, I do believe is true, and that is there are other ways in which your continued and passionate storytelling will potentially uh, pay off. And that connects to things like Trillium grants, summer employment grants, and, and so forth. You know, they, they, they are connected to some pots of money uh, directly, and they can have an influence on your ability to... Uh, be approved for those grants or not, as the case may be. So uh, sorry about this, but I, I, I just have to say, please keep on trying. I think the other thing to, to, to say as well is, you know, it's not that big a legislature. They're talking to one another on a regular basis. They may not be the Minister of Culture, but goodness knows they can uh, run into the Minister of Culture on a daily basis and have a quick word. That's handy. Um, Bob Williams from the um, Citizens for the Kitchener-Waterloo Symphony, and I think the Volunteer Committee as well, if I've got that right, Bob, asked about a different strategy to approach government MPPs as opposed to opposition MPPs. Um, I'll say a couple of things, and they might seem like they're um, slightly contradictory, uh, but bear with me. Uh, first thing is, I think we're allowed to take the same recommendations uh, to both um, uh, the ruling party, uh, representatives as well as members of the opposition. Um, the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs is an all-party committee. Uh, the parties are represented by the proportion of seats that they occupy at Queen's Park. Uh, and you know the, the, the story um, and, the, and the asks can be fairly similar. I think the opportunity uh, and, and why it's important to engage with opposition MPPs uh, as well as people uh, currently um, you know, holding the, the, the balance of power at, at Queen's Park, uh, the value of connecting with them is that we cannot predict uh, what the outcomes of future elections will be. We are making the case to absolutely everyone um, in the hope that uh, support for the arts 
is not a partisan issue, but it is something that everybody sees, everybody feels, and everybody is prepared to get behind. Again, that may be seen as relentlessly naive, uh, but I do think that um, we're playing a long game, we're planting seeds for the future, uh, and we're also trying not to get uh, triangulated as a topic or a sector that's only of interest to some parties and not to others. Uh, you know, this should be uh, mom, apple pie, and I don't know what else, but just, uh, you know, it's like the oxygen we breathe. I know I'm speaking to the converted here. Uh, we kind of need not to get boxed into, uh, in, into partisan positions. All of this said, I think it's fair to say that um, if you have specific uh, concerns or, if, or if, if, if you're asked to go into more detail about how challenging your circumstances are, um, tell the truth. Um, be, be transparent about what you're up against and what you're hoping for. Um, I, I think I'll just uh, park that one. Um, Okay, I'm moving on to the next question. I'm wondering about the folks who don't necessarily have time for a long game. Uh, and this comes from Riley Dupuy of the Thunder Bay Symphony Orchestra. For us, there is some immediacy in what we are trying to achieve. <laughs> in which case, it's just do it and do it and do it and do it with all the passion that you can muster. Um, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily seeing... Um, a giant level of will on the part of the current government to see the arts as the solution to all of their problems and to all of the problems that they're trying to resolve on behalf of, uh, of Ontarians. Uh, if you have tips or tricks on how to get that done, um, bring it to me. Uh, but I'm not sure that um, we have not seen uh, a, a giant level of responsiveness post pandemic to the challenges that arts organizations are facing. I think all we can do is tell the truth about how hard uh, things are right now uh, and indicate how quickly we need them to move. Whether or not that inspires action or simply causes them to turn away will be a matter of personal choice. Ah, okay. And so I, I appreciate that. I understand uh, what you're saying and I, I, I support you in, in the work that you're doing. Uh, Riley, for the TBSO and on behalf of the sector. Um, Matt McGeechee has put in a rather uh, interesting note uh, that party political, political party donations are a matter of public record. If you cross-reference your boards and donors to the list of progressive conservative party donors, or in fact donors to any other political party, uh, and then ask that donor to join you in a meeting, it is one way to get an MPP's attention. Uh, Matt, um, do you have some uh, lived experience of getting that done, and uh, how's that gone for you? Uh, can we, Matt, are you, first of all, uh, do you want to give us a little note in terms of, are you prepared to speak um, uh, to, to your experiences doing this? He says yes. Uh, David, can I ask you to uh, let Matt um, address us uh, using his voice? Yeah, not really good to go now. Okay, uh, Matt, welcome. Hi, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Matt McGeechee from the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. Uh, so, yes, I have very direct experience with this. Um, some of you will recall that uh, this time last year, the uh, government was proposing a $10 million cut to the Ontario Arts Council and um, uh, the Orchestras Canada uh, community, along with all the other uh, funded organizations sort of banded together. And one of the things that we found very, very effective was cross-referencing a list of uh, TSO donors, board members and former board members who were also donors to the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario. And we sent them a note saying, this is what the government is uh, proposing to do. Here is what the impact of that cut would be on the TSO. And as a, um, uh, as a person who has donated to the governing party 
and as somebody who has really um, uh, shown their commitment to the Toronto Symphony Orchestra through a donation, would you please copy and paste this email to your member of provincial parliament, letting them know that um, arts and culture funding and adequate funding for the OAC is an important electoral issue for you. And we had a pretty substantial uptake on that actually um, when we were when we were that targeted. And in the perverse world of Queen's Park at the moment, we got a $10 million cut down to a $5 million cut, which we had to accept as a, as a win. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, those who are the nearest and dearest for all of us um, are inclined to help in whatever way they can. And it is not necessarily a partisan political issue for them, but for a politician, it is a partisan political issue. And they need to be hearing from people who are their supporters that um, that actually these proposals are uh, are worthwhile. And if you have a government uh, MPP that is a member of the PC party at the moment, um, it's critically important, especially if they're a backbencher, because backbenchers do tend to start making some noise to their colleagues who are in cabinet when important institutions in their writing, such as all of the orchestras on this call, start to say, you know, this is an this is an area of impact for members of our community. Um, so, yeah, I, I just can't emphasize enough that the more that we can get people who already love us to make some noise with elected officials so that we're not necessarily going into a meeting alone because it may be easy to dismiss the executive director as one of the three that your MPP will see that morning before coffee. But when our donors and audience members who are also the voters start knocking on their door and saying, you know, I'd like to talk to you about funding from my local orchestra that becomes uh, something that they can then take back to their caucus meetings. And it has had an impact. Um, yeah, that's been my experience, Catherine. Uh, that's great, Matt. Thank you so much uh, for sharing. And, you know, I, I think this is where the um, sort of partisan uh, analysis or the, the awareness of, of, of who's, who's supporting whom uh, can come in incredibly handy. Um, you know, I think that our concerts do tend to be a place where people of a range of political pers perspectives gather. Uh, we can't necessarily judge who they're connected to or make assumptions. Can I also, I want to say something else about assumptions. Um, I've met with a lot of elected officials over the course of my work at Orchestras Canada, and I will be celebrating my 19th anniversary at OC this March. Um, hold the flowers. Um and I, I, yeah, I, it wasn't something that I had specialized in prior to starting my job here, but um, oh my goodness, uh, I had a steep learning curve and uh, it's something that I have really grown to enjoy. I went into these um, often making assumptions about what the meeting was going to be like, what kind of reception I would get, what kind of questions I'd get, what kind of hearing um, I would have. And I have to say in the hundreds of meetings that I've had over my time at Orchestras Canada with elected officials, um, I've had exactly one where I got yelled at, um, one where you know, sort of had to pick myself up uh, off the floor uh, in the context of the meeting, uh, that by and large, uh, these are people who care deeply about their communities, who believe in the concept of community service, and where there's almost always an opportunity to make a kind of connection uh, between the things that they are passionate about, why they ran for office in the first place, and what it is that we do on a daily basis. So it's a very rare meeting that I've had where there are not some very good laughs, um, a few great stories uh, about or inspired by the community. Um, and, you know, just a, a genuine sense, I think, of mutual appreciation. So um, make no assumptions about who's in your audience, um, who is or was on your board, uh, and who's, who's representing you in terms of the ways that you might find uh, just a, a way of, of 
kind of reaching into their hearts and uh, reminding them of, of the importance and the connections associated with what you do. Something that I found handy, and I think we can potentially add it to the handy links page on our website, uh, is the Ontario Arts Council does have open data available. There's information available about um, who has received grants from the Ontario Arts Council. And it could be sorted by writing. That's also a useful thing to take into a meeting, uh, just so that the MPP will understand the impact of OAC investment uh, in their writings. Similarly, there's an incredibly impressive list of um, Ontario arts organizations who are part of the Ontario Arts Endowment Fund. Uh, and so uh, the idea that uh, we're not just talking about one organization or uh, one individual, we're talking about perhaps a few different arts organizations in the writings, uh, there may be something there uh, to, to work with as well, to make it clear that you're not just speaking for you know your own well-being, uh, but for the well-being of an entire ecosystem in the writing uh, that the MPP can, can appreciate. Okay, uh, Nancy Stott-Jones has asked the question um, about uh, other uh, potential resources to um, juice up uh, sort of discussion around uh, arts education uh, and the role of professional arts organizations. She's asked specifically about the Canadian Network for Arts and Learning. Thank you, Nancy. That is absolutely uh, one that I turn to. Um, they are working to put together kind of a you know an overview of all of the research that is out there that connects to arts and learning, uh, drawing on the resources from a range of other organizations. I specifically did a name check for People for Education simply because their, um, their research on Ontario uh, specific arts education availability in schools was so very germane to the point that we are making, but the Canadian Network for Arts and Learning is absolutely uh, a first-class resource. Um, and you know, part of what uh, I, I turn to on a regular basis to inspire my thinking um, about the arguments for arts education in in schools, what kind of impact it has, uh, and what kind of provision is is actually available right across the country. So, thank you, excellent uh, excellent resource to uh, to recommend. Just going to double check uh, the. Q and A and in the chat and see if there's uh, anything else there that uh, has has popped up during the discussion. And I think we may be uh, on the edge of um, being able to wrap today's session up, perhaps a little bit early, but uh, I, I call that a win uh, for uh, productivity and uh, time to get on with your days. Uh, David, uh, can I turn it over to you at this point? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, that was really great. I hope that was helpful. I had the feeling it was. I I did definitely learn a lot, and thanks uh, also to Matt for your for your input there. Um, as I said at the beginning, there is going to be uh, the recording made available on our website in the coming days. Uh, that hence the, the recording in progress prompt when you logged in. Uh, so as soon as this is up, I could not make it uh, to today's meeting. Uh, and that being said, I think that's about it. So uh, thanks again for coming, everybody. And um, have a great rest of your day. Much appreciated, everyone. Thank you so much. And uh, we, we are counting on your support. And you can count on us uh, to support your efforts as well. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Have a great day, OK? Cool.